And so, may I say a warm welcome to you, our audience, and to the upcoming speakers. You cannot have a single virtual event these days unless there's some kind of technical hitch. And hey, we actually got it done right at the outset. So for the technical team here, all their Christmases did not come at once just now. A warm thanks to Alejandro and also to Ella. I think everybody should know, literally, if I was to give you multiple choice questions now, how exactly this fabulously interactive platform works. So shortly, as they did indicate, we are going to have an opening session stuffed with four fabulous speakers. But I just want to make sure for all of you that you are listening in the language of your choice, because we do have interpretation from English into French, German, Spanish, Italian and Polish. So do make sure that you are set up correctly. My name is Katrina Sickle. I'm a broadcaster and I'm a moderator and I have the immense privilege of navigating all of us through this fabulous event until we close things with a flourish tomorrow at half past one Brussels time. Now, as I think you're aware, this event is brought to you by a host of different organisations. We've got, of course, the European Committee of the Regions in cooperation with other institutions. The Parliament, the European Commission, the European Council, the European Economic and Social Committee, uh, also the EIB and the OECD. And we're going to hear from representatives of most of those organisations in a brilliant, very punchy and dynamic closing session tomorrow. Tomorrow. But back to the now. We've got a host of fabulous speakers. Now, you do know that if you want to find out about any of them, you can on the europecom.com platform, the europecom.eu platform, and also on the Let's Get Digital platform. Have a look. You can see their bios. I'll just say a few words about all of them. Now, what are we going to talk about? You know what the theme is, changing communication, communicating change. So we've got those three topics that Ella and Alejandro laid out in the opening. We're going to focus on democracy, we're going to focus on the Green Deal and all things climate change, and we're also going to focus on digitalisation. And we are going to hone in on the specific impact that COVID-19 has had on all of these different thematic areas. And of course they overlap, but it doesn't need me to tell you that because you're the experts. Instead of the usual panel debates, we've got something much more vibrant. We've got some TED Talk style Europecom talks. We've got this opening session when we've got some vibrant presentations from our speakers. We've got those interactive ideas labs and fabulous uh, workshops so you can make sure that your voice is also heard. Now, you heard about the chat function, which is on the platform. That's to just say your piece. Of course, there's Twitter, hashtag EuropeTom. But there is another way that you can interact with the speakers, and that's through the Q&A function on the platform. So that's within each session. Now, the golden rule is, and you should know this because you've done enough uh, virtual events since more than a year now, either attended them or participated as a speaker, you've got to keep your question short. Short and sweet, say to whom it's addressed, they'll be curated, sent to me, and I'll pose them to the speakers in the latter half of this opening session. Now, you know all about the marketplace, you know all about the carousel, you know all about getting in touch with people. Do you know about the polls? I'd like to ask you now if you can take part in two opening polls, just to make sure that you're alive, awake, alert and with us. Now, if you go onto the platform and you click on that function, there's a first poll, super easy, just to get you going in case you haven't had your coffee yet. I'm a communication expert from a local, regional, national or European authority, private sector, a private communication agency, working for an NGO. I'm actually coming from an academic setting, but that's my specialism, communication. Actually, none of the above. I'm somebody totally random. I'm just really curious about the content of this event. I'm going to look down now because I'm surrounded by screens here and here and, well, in front of me, multiple cameras. And just in front of me, I've got uh, the poll. Now, I'm just going to see if anybody is answering that poll. I'm waiting for stuff to come in live. Oh, things are dropping in. Things are dropping in there. I'm going to turn to my lovely colleague here to see if I need to push anything to get those results. But if not, you're going to see me. I've got, I've got a lovely team surrounding me. Look at me. I'm like the Queen of England, just asking people to do many things. I might actually get someone to bring me a coffee in a moment. I'm just going to see if we can get any results. I can't see them, but perhaps you all can. 
Here we go. Oh, oh, I'm going to actually borrow this gentleman's lap. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. OK, let's have a look. Where are we? OK, so a local, regional, national or European authority. That makes sense. Academic setting. Then it's the NGO. None of the other and the private communication agency. So most of you, and I'm not surprised, do come from those authorities around Europe at various levels. I'm going to give this back now. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm going to hang on to it because we do have another poll. Could you take part in the second poll, please? Look at that. You can see his hands coming in. I love that. He's kind of like a ninja who's staying off stage, being very, very efficient. Second poll is a bit different. For you, what would you say is the single biggest challenge in communication? Now, I've only listed a few things that I think, but you might have another idea. Is it navigating one's way through the noise on social media? Is it keeping up with the pace of information exchange? Is it orchestrating integrated campaigns for heterogeneous audiences? Is it grabbing audience attention with something really fresh and surprising? Or is it being able to get a true measurement of a campaign or a message's impact? So let me just give you a heartbeat to let us know what you think, and then I promise I'm going to invite our speakers of this opening session to join me on screen. But let me just give you a bit more time to warm up, see what you think, what's the biggest challenge for you as a communicator in communication? Is it cutting through the noise? Is it somehow coming up with a message that fits such a broad and diverse audience? Is it being able to measure the impact of that or of a campaign? Is it keeping up with the pace? Everything is so rapid. And we're going to hear more about that from our first speaker, who is going to specialise in all things digital. So I'm just going to ask my lovely colleague, who actually is only just a pair of forearms, as you can see. Look, there. Oh, no, only a hand now, actually. Where is? OK, so the biggest challenge, you say, is grabbing audience attention with something fresh and surprising. Absolutely, getting a true measurement of a message's impact. I would agree with that. Navigating one's way through the noise on social media, keeping up with the pace of information exchange. OK, so you're all pretty good at orchestrating integrated campaigns to meet the needs of diverse audiences, but grabbing attention seems to be something that is perhaps getting trickier and trickier. OK, so the forearms are now going to come back and take this laptop. <laughs> there you go. And now we can dive in. So we have got four eloquent speakers. We've got these thematic strands. They're going to share their experience and their expertise on communicating on these issues and with specific audiences in times of change. So can I ask all four first to please join me on screen so that you can say hello to the audience and they to you. And of course, I just have three of you because, hey, a virtual event would not be a virtual event if something kept having hiccups. So <laughs> Look at that lovely lady with the red lipstick, that Dominique Roche. So you can have a wave. You have a beautiful picture behind you. Uh, let me say a few words about you. Now, you specialise in digital communication for public bodies, for EU institutions, for more, and you help diverse stakeholders, and I quote, not least decision makers, understand that the internet isn't just a big blob I think these were your words, not if they are, but rather a means of reaching very different communities. Is that, uh, I think those were your exact words, is that correct? The internet is not just a big blob. Can you hear me? Yes, I can now. Ah, yeah. yes, I did say that. I feel the internet offers so many opportunities and we should just like grab it with both hands and just make the best of it. Thank you. And you're going to tell us exactly how in just a moment, but hold that thought. Now, I'm not going to come to our specialist in uh, the Green Deal and all things climate because I can't see her with us yet. But I am now going to pass to the gentleman from Ipsos. It's very clear who he is, so he may not even need to wave. Nando Pagnoncelli, you joined Ipsos, which is a global leader in market research and opinion polling in the early 2000s, 2004, but you actually focused and founded Ipsos Public Affairs because that's the part of the group that deals with public opinion research, which is brilliant for us because you're going to share some hot off the press Euro flash Euro barometer results. People around the EU who were polled, their opinions on the EU and how the EU handled things in this time of, well, 
we're not even beyond it, but in this time of crisis. Let me just give a reminder to everybody. Nando has some great slides. So if you want to follow what he's saying and access them, just go to the main menu on the platform, go into the tab Files, and there they wait. So get ready, and then you can follow his presentation when it comes up shortly in this session. So more from you, Nando, in just a moment. I'm going to pass on to the third of our speakers who's already with us. He is Gaffar Rampage. He's a copywriter and he's a communication specialist. I love it. Thank you. You also have a particularly lovely background, so you must have done this before. The whole virtual stuff. You also focus on institutions, intergovernmental organisations and NGOs, and you're kind of coming to share two things with us. First, a little bit of your experience at the European Youth Event and how it links to the Future of Europe conference, but also very much on how you think the EU communicates with young people and maybe what it could do differently. Let's see. So, you can all take a step backstage again momentarily. We're sort of running this like a TV broadcast. And I'm going to give us a bit of insight into the first of our speakers and the theme. So what is the theme? Let's have a look. And so you all know the pandemic has boosted the development of and the engagement with digital transformation like absolutely never before. But how exactly has it changed personal and professional communication practices? And importantly, are we exploiting it to the fullest extent in the way that can best serve us? You heard the very positive uh, words there that came from our initial speaker. And I think she can say a little bit on how is it impacting on human interaction? Where do we fit into all that? How is it shaping that? Welcome back to the screen, Dominic Roche. So Dominic, I'm going to say no more. Everyone's heard enough from me. I'm going to allow you to really kick things off with great pizzazz and style and tell us more. <laughs> Take us on a digital journey and tell us what we know and what we don't know. Give us some food for thought. I'll pop back at the end and pose you a question or two. Thank you so much. Thanks, Katrina, for the lovely intro, and thank you to the Europecom team for inviting me. Uh, COVID has brought about many unexpected changes, some hit close to home. Personally, I never expected to wear my hair short again. But the ones that matter to us today are in communication, like how virtual event management has shifted from a niche skill to a vital part of modern communication team. The most obvious change, and what we're here to talk about today, is the incredible acceleration of digitalization in communication. So now it has become clear, it was reluctance, not impossibility, that made digitalization so slow. Quarantine forced everyone to adopt some sort of millennial mindset. And now it seems we have all found common ground. Everyone is Zooming, everyone is remote working, and everyone has accepted that digital is not going to go away. So let us truly embrace it. Today, I'd like to share with you how I see these transformations as a digital communication specialist, but also as someone who's affected by these changes in how I work. When I was preparing for this panel, I looked at the title, Changing Communication, Communicating Change. I decided to take it very literally. So first, let us take a look at how communication is changing. We have all seen the hallmarks of digitalization of communication. As I mentioned, remote working is the most obvious. It changed the way we communicate, it, communicate at the micro level, person to person. Pre-COVID, there was a huge amount of cultural resistance to it, but now it's clear it works. It doesn't matter if you drop something in your kitchen, you can effectively run a team in your pajamas. Sweatpants do not impact productivity. Trust me. However, this transition has not necessarily been smooth. Now I will zoom out a little more from the interpersonal to the team. People are still figuring out aspects of the new normal, like how to share on social media that you had an online meeting. Screenshots of tiny unrecognizable faces on screen? Not the answer. This is all to say there are still awkward barriers to overcome some new rhythms to adjust to as communicators. But if I zoom out one more time to a societal level, 
we see COVID has broken down barriers to tech too. Consider the humble QR code, a technology once laughed at for being redundant, but now its time has come. I've talked a bit about how COVID has changed communication. Now I wanna look how, at how we can change communication after COVID. And to do that, we need to accept a few truths. An important one is that we need a new attitude to digital. Pre-COVID, we said digital first. During the lockdown, we learned that is not true. We often put digital last. I have worked in different public institutions on different teams with different tasks, and I've launched web pages, announcements, and campaigns, and it has always been stressful. We may have mastered the art of public engagement, yet we always rush when it comes to the production process. To me, this is very frustrating. It makes work a little less fun and less effective. Often, this is because we think communication late and digital last in the priority list. We think that putting out a page or a tweet is enough and we can build on it from there. But communication does not start when all your content is live. It starts the moment the need for content arises. We are all trained and experienced communication experts. Why is it so hard? Why can't coordination and preparation just find its own place? Like a QR code. The problem is that we have an applied millennial mindset to all aspects of digitalization. What do I mean by millennial mindset? I mean, stopping using digital tools as placeholder for all tools. When the car was invented, we didn't sit on top of it like a horse. When the light bulb was invented, we didn't light it up with a match. So why do we insist on using digital tools in antiquated ways? For example, Email is not an effective collaboration tool. I have 100 million documents and folders on my desktop, all because people are addicted to attachments. The common practice is somebody shares information as document attached to team. People are expected to individually download the document, feedback is returned individually, and then you send the document again as an email attachment. We are not working with paper, pens, and annotation. Use community documents, please. Another example is online meetings. Online meetings should be about connecting to people. We oftentimes use it to exchange information. We have all been thinking, this meeting could have been an email. And in many aspects of our work, daily work lives, we still think digital a bit upside down. And that needs to change. I want us all to work a little bit more like a QR code. So I don't mean square and widget, I mean dynamically connecting the target audience with the relevant information. And the first step is organizing our communication a bit better. We need funnels, pipeline, and streamlining for processes. We should make use of digital tools and programs and use them how they are meant to be used. That may sound abstract, but just like the QR code was, the solution is right in front of you. But when you have an issue with IT, you send out an email to the IT help desk. You request enter the ticketing system, and now your query can be followed through until the problem is solved. These highly systemized approaches work. Why not apply them to communication too? If your team is faced with complex tasks and multiple stakeholders, you need business management software. It is as true for your IT team as it is for you. It will save you time and money, and equally as important, it will reduce frustration, make it work a little bit more efficient and a little bit more fun. Next, we need to stay ahead of the game. Already, AI can, AI can write text and post on par with many people. That doesn't necessarily mean that we will be replaced, but it does mean that our ways of work are likely to change that we might be humans with robot assistants, or even vice versa. We are at the verge of a major digital revolution, moving web from web two to web three. The concept of internet and digital is changing before our eyes and we as governments, as institutions, and as state bodies will be under scrutiny in how we react. It's like a foot race. The further we fall behind, the harder it will be to catch up. So let us invest in our teams now 
so we can keep up with the rapidly changing digitalized world. Finally, we need to accept the changes that have already happened. People will not go back to the office. Social media and digital communicators, the rhythm of chasing commuters is gone. Gym times have changed and social patterns too. People spend more time online, but in different ways. They are unavailable for your content, although they are online. They are doing remote fitness classes, they're buying groceries. The internet as such became denser. The fight for engagement will get tougher. Accepting these changes will be a great first step to adapting to the digital world. So that's a few of my reflection on COVID and its changes. I'm clearly a tech evangelist. I believe in these developments and in their net good and their potential for us as communicators. But I'm also realistic. So let me close with this. Don't forget the one thing that software and our robot replacements lack, the ability to form a human connection, arguably the most important part of communication. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I was literally off screen there listening with great attention, scribbling. Look, look at my kind of rubbishy notes. Look at that. I've got to show those. Um, super interesting. I have a couple of questions, but I do want to remind our audience that this session is also for them. So you can put questions short and sweet, truly, to Dominique at any point, and I can pose more of them at the end. But Dominique, don't go away. Come back with me because I have a couple now. I have so many. First of all, an easy one. How many teams have you run in your pyjamas? And I don't mean Microsoft Teams meetings, since we've all had enough of those. How many teams have you run? Come on, are you in pyjamas now? Well, I wear casual downstairs and a business upstairs, as you do during COVID times. So. Okay. Um, and I've done this basically all through COVID. So why not be comfortable in your skin? I've literally been in my pyjamas, unwashed, unkempt, and it worked. I oh, John, and Skip, thank you for adding unwashed, unkempt. Now we have the full picture. <laughs> while, while we're on that, just a couple of questions, please. Um, there in the poll at the beginning, if I'm correct, with the lovely gentleman whose forearms passed me the results, um, we talked, people talked about grabbing attention with something fresh and surprising, being wow, getting more challenging. So in your experience, because you really have worked with private and public sector and you're helping people craft this arena and you're helping people use it to their benefit. Is there anything you would say, well, this is what I notice is a good way. This is a, this is a new trend in digital. This is what we need to think about in digital if we want to cut through and grab attention. Is there any just one, one or two short tip that you would propose to those audience members who see that as being particularly challenging? I think it's a golden oldie. It's about being authentic. So you must be able to sell what you what you say. So this is this is the golden rule. So don't try to be something else. Don't try to be different. Just find the essence of what you are and what you can actually put out there. And that's the secret to engagement. And if that means you only reach 10,000 people, then you've reached 10,000 mm. people. So create mm -hmm. benchmarks for yourself and be authentic. Right. And I'm just going to ask the tech team to leave me on with you, as then I can, have bit, I can have a bit more of a sense that I'm with you. Now, something you said there, forgive me if I caught it wrongly, I don't think so, but if you could slightly expand, you said communication or digital communication or communication in general starts from when uh, the need for content arises, not starts. Just, just explain a little bit what you mean by that. Well, we all work with multiple stakeholders. And for instance, when we have a campaign, usually an idea is born somewhere in the cabinet or in some committee, and then it travels with different teams. And then right at the end, someone comes up and says, oh, I need a web page and I need a campaign for social media. And you think, how can you be working on this for weeks and weeks? And you come to us as digital content creators last. So the moment you know you are having an event and you want to have it broadcast digitally or you want to have it communicated digitally, you should get these teams involved early. Yeah. That means graphic design, web, all of the copywriters. You need to get them on board early so they can be creative because they are not rushed. OK, absolutely. And what I pick up, two things from what you said. In the first answer, you were talking about, in some ways, quality over quantity. You linked being authentic 
with quality he said hey cat if it's only 10,000 but you've really reached them there's quality and they're again not being rushed so giving that time to the creative process so that what comes out does is credible and robust a last question because again you have had the privilege and the pleasure with your expertise of engaging of citizen engagement you've had a feel of that from various different angles um, linking that with what you said about having a millennial mindset just say a couple of words on digital literacy because hey I mean I have an 11 year old I'm 53 I'm also a bit of a Luddite by choice which ain't great okay and yet I moderate on big things like blockchain and HPC uh, I see around me different people of different age groups who are again digital natives or not plus the democratic the demographic challenge people getting older, changing jobs, lifelong learning. How does all of this fit in in the digital transformation, this whole aspect of digital literacy in its widest sense? Well, I think you need to accept your limits. Not everyone can be on par when it comes to the te technological ability or the ability to engage with technology. And that's why it's difficult to run these teams because you have teams that are very diverse from very tech to not so tech at all. So, but the only thing I can say is it's just like I said with the with the online meetings in my in my speech, you have to give it a try and you will see it works. So maybe lose the fear a little bit, dip in a towel into the water, see how it feels, then put in the whole foot and then gradually walk in. If you don't make it all the way to the swim, that's fine. And just like stay at the end or at the, the, the low side of the water and be comfortable there. So okay. do what you can within your comfort zone. Thank you. So I'm going to try. I'm now currently in the sign of the shallows with a pina colada in one hand and an ice cream in the other, if I pick up on your metaphor there. So I think I might just push a little bit further up to the waist and see if I see if I can inch my way forwards there. Thank you. Don't go away or at least temporarily go away. I'm going to come back and see. I'm sure you will have many questions that come in from the audience and I'll come back to those in a bit. So who have we got next? Well, unfortunately, our delightful human rights and climate activist is not with us at the moment, and I'm not sure she will be, but I do know that within this uh, opening session, all of these good speakers are going to touch on the Green Deal and climate change in some way. So I'm just going to give you, our audience, a heads up and them to say you're absolutely welcome. But let's first take another theme and find out what that theme is. That's the one we just had, but interesting. The one we're now going to come to is, of course, democracy. And it doesn't need me to tell you, but because I'm the moderator, I will. Uh, the rapid, the drastic changes in everyday life that all of us have experienced over the last 20-ish months have, I would say, challenged democracy in a very, very particular way. And I've seen even the word be misused, misappropriated, reappropriated. I think everybody has their own definition and their own feeling about what it means. And it's certainly impacted on how information is packaged up, how it's disseminated, how it's received, absorbed, regurgitated, passed on at local, regional, national and EU level. So it impacts how all of us share and discuss and chew over and evolve our opinions. So I'm now going to explore with the first of two speakers within this democracy theme some of the top line results of a recent hot off the press flash Eurobarometer survey. It's public opinion in the EU regions. Now take a moment if you haven't done so already I think he'll be grateful if you go to the main menu on the platform and you click and you click on files you will be able to pull up hey presto the presentation that our next gentleman is going to make. So, can I please welcome to join me Nando Pagnoncelli. I don't hear you. I hope you hear me. I don't hear you yet. Thank you. Uh, can Thank I, Nando, you, can, Nando, can I just say, there's always one with the sound and it was you. No, I, I tease you. There's always somebody at the virtual event. It's impossible to remember to put on the mics. Now, 
You joined this global leader in market research and opinion polling early in early 2000s. And now you are actually, I mean, in 2006, a couple of years later, you were appointed chairman and CEO of Ipsos in Italy. But just so that people know, it's not just that you, you teach and you write around this. In fact, you teach at a university in Milan on an analysis of public opinion. So it's not just collating the public opinion, it's analysing it too. Before I let you present and give our audience some time to take your slides from the platform, let me ask you, what's your definition of democracy? Well, thank you, Katrina. Thank you all for having me today. What is democracy to me? Democracy is uh, the continuous search for a balance between citizens, rights and duties. We must take care of democracy because it's not acquired and is not forever. Although it is imperfect, uh, it is the best government system available. Uh, as Winston Churchill said in a famous speech uh, in uh, the House of Commons, uh, on November 1947, uh, he said, uh, uh, no one pretends that democracy is perfect or all wise. Indeed, it has been said that democracy is the worst form of government except all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. Thank I you. I agree with him. Thank you very much. And again, let me remind our audience, if you have anything, if you want to put your point of view or even share it in the chat about what you think your definition of democracy is, if it's imperfect, uh, if it's not always wise, please, we'd love to hear that and on Twitter. But meanwhile, Nando, come back to me. I'm going to give you the floor for sort of seven or eight minutes to please lay out very beautifully the top lines, some of those top lines of that flash Eurobarometer. Let's find out what people around Europe think about the EU, how it's doing in their region, and a bit of a feel about how it's doing in the crisis and some of the big actions and initiatives that are on the table. So over to you. Thank you so much. OK, thank you. Let's now try and give you a sort of review over some of these interesting data, uh, which we collected on behalf of the DGCOMS in what is called the Eurobarometer Flash, a polling system which helps to understand the sentiment of more than 400 million of European citizens around a number of topics. My task today is to guide you through how the citizen in the 27 EU countries evaluate the functioning of democracy in the Union. And let's start with the basic figures. On slide two, if you are connected with the platform, we have interviewed more than 62,000 citizens in 27 countries and uh, 194 regions in uh, regions in the Union. Um, these are really fresh data as uh, the survey was closed at the end of October, just a couple of weeks ago. Let's start from uh, how the Europeans feel about the quality of life. Uh, things look uh, good for eight out of 10 citizens taken uh, as a wall. The same question was asked in 2018, and the results were not so positive. Uh, but this is for a number of reasons. One of them being uh, that after Brexit, we don't have the UK citizens anymore in the sample, in our sample. And uh, we know that they, they, they were unhappy about a number of things. Another reason is uh, uh, the after COVID effect uh, with a surge of optimism and with people reconsidering things under a different perspective, maybe a bit of a survivor syndrome. But uh, the advantage of having polled on uh, such a granular scale becomes clear if you will take the time to look at the maps 
where a color code shows you the intensity of responses. These are a very nice and clear way to get a sense of what happens where. For instance, in the case of the quality of life, the distribution of the color codes will show you that there are no huge differences in the evaluation of quality of life across the many regions which were polled. We will see then what happens with opinions on other topics. Let's take the economic situation and how it is perceived. Again, if you take the total data, for a majority of Europeans, the situation comes across as either good or very good, but good, but then this is not the case if you look at the corresponding map. In this case, the diversity of, of opinions is more marked. And we see, for example, that in the Southern Europe, there are regions with a significantly lower level of satisfaction with the economic situation. Not surprisingly, by the way, uh, and if you take the time to compare this result with the evaluation of the issues affecting the different regions, you will understand why. In fact, when we ask the people to tell us what uh, the biggest issues are in their local area, you will find out that the economy and the unemployment are the topmost problems for one citizen out of three, followed by health and cost of living, both important for one citizen out of four. And finally, the environmental topic is top of mind for one of five of Europeans. But here again, if you take some time to look at the map of Europe in detail, you will see, for example, that the struggle with employment and economics effect affects more the people in the southern regions. While for environment and climate change, we see a concentration of attention in Central Europe, which does not come as a surprise, given the well-known sensitivity of Germans to the protection of the environment, and uh, how this also has affected their political choices. Taking now about the topic of, the, of these past 18 months, we have looked into how the EU, European Union has performed in fight with the pandemic and with uh, what expectation are there for many plans next generation EU and Green Deal. Let's start with the measure to fight COVID-19. The differences you will be able to spot in the map are explained by the different pace at which each country and each region was affected by the spread of pandemics and by how long they fought a solitary war before the European Union came into a picture and their effect of their action kicked in. If you look at Italy, for example, you will see the lowest value of all. Italy is where the initial measures against the pandemic were totally local as opposed to the rest of Europe where the public opinion feels they were not alone in the fight. And you will see also able to look at the different levels of expectations toward the effects of the next generation EU in being a solution to the challenges of a post-COVID period. The regions with darker shades in the map it's where people have high, higher expectation of effectiveness. They are also those regions where the pandemic more severely affected issues such as employment 
and economy. And finally, to get back to communication topic, which a key element in the formation of public opinion, if you look at what the expectation are in terms of uh, who should be best placed to talk to people about Europe, it comes out that the local representative are the best ambassadors, member of parliaments, local and national politicians should be the ones who take the narrative into their areas and who make people understand what the EU is about. People can interpret the needs and expectation locally and who can adapt the message. That's, uh, that's all. Uh, the, the, the topic on, on our survey, and I think it's an interesting uh, uh, suggestion to, to, to speak about Europe, democracy, and uh, the new situation uh, came out from uh, COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And look, now I've actually gone digital as well as the Luddite with the paper. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I hope people did follow. I just want to be clear to everybody, if I may, and if I'm correct, Nando, this was conducted by phone. And so I'd asked you, hadn't I, you know, when this was being conducted, did people understand, you know, what next gen EU is, what the recovery plan is, you know, what the European Green Deal even in some cases is. But we need to be clear that a definition of the EU measures was included in the, measure, in the questions that were asked to the respondents. So they were given that context in order that they could answer in a way that was kind of cred credible and meaningful. I have a question for you. It might be an obvious one, but interesting. I noted there that you were, when you were talking about those four key areas, that there was a prevalence of concern or the most concern, economy, unemployment, health, probably a no-brainer with COVID, cost of living, not sure that ever changes, particularly within the current context, and of course, environment and climate change. And you're saying, you know, here's the difference. If we look at Germany, there is some more sensitivity towards that. And so there are diverse opinions. But within any of what came in, and even something that you haven't shared with us, because those were just the top lines, did you have any particular surprises? I mean, you have experience for a long time in this. Did you go, oh, wow, OK, that one? I didn't see it coming. The result I was most surprised by is the level of expected effectiveness of the European deal, Green Deal. I did not expect this polarization of opinion with 47% positives and 46% critics. Maybe okay. it depends on the high expectations on, and on the hope that the plan succeeds rapidly. rapidly. Okay. What we, what we must be aware of this is that to succeed, this plan needs time and the commitment of all countries, of their institution and uh, their citizen, not only of the EU. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. And just hot off the, well, hot off the iPad, not hot off the press. Uh, there is a, a lovely question here from Erika Savazzi. She is an exhibitor for the Young Elected Politicians Programme at the Committee of the Regions. And she says, Nando, have you noticed any link between the economic situation and people's opinion on democracy? Of course, uh, there is a, a very strong relation with these two aspects. Um, in, in countries who the situation is worse, uh, of course, uh, there is uh, a risk uh, that democracy is not... Uh, uh, Lead, lead positively. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, there is uh, many, many problems uh, where the situation uh, is, is, is worse mm -hmm. in terms of representatives and uh, in terms of uh, uh, risk of populism. OK. And, and another one for you, just I follow up, because you've got a few coming in. Just one more, then I'll pass to our third speaker and I'll come back 
to some questions for because there's a lot that have come in for Dominique as well. Just one last question for you momentarily, Nando. A question um, just in terms of the measurement. How did you measure the impact of COVID when you were talking about people's opinions on how they felt impacted? What was the kind of framework of that and therefore dictating the measurement of that? Uh, of course, we have uh, direct questions, uh, uh, and uh, we, we we ask the question to 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 measure the consequences at the individual level mm -hmm. of their lives. Okay. And, um, okay. Attitudes and behavior. Attitudes. With direct questions. Okay, so it could have been as they're absolutely individual situations. Of in course. terms of their lives, their work, the their relatives. And then we aggregate the, the answers mm -hmm. just to understand the dynamic, the social dynamics. Of okay, okay. Hold that thought. But at the individual oh. level, the question is. Sorry, say again what well, I just missed you there because I thought you'd finished. At a... At the individual level. At the individual level. Okay. okay. So, hold that thought. I'm now going to come to a second speaker in the same theme and, and an update. E oh, there we have Anuna. So it's so lovely. You have found time at COP. I think you've borrowed a laptop, you've borrowed a building, you've borrowed a room, <laughs> you've joined us. Can I take the other speaker first or shall I jump to you? Is your time a little bit limited? Tell me. No, no, my absolute apologies for being late. I'm so happy I could make it. Definitely go to the second speaker okay. and I'll be here uh, for later. Okay, let me just say, abs that. let me use that overused phrase, better late than never, truly. So delighted you can be with us and so delighted you can be with us from there. I'm just going to continue this theme because we're, we're in democracy and I'm going to come to the lovely Gaffar. Now, Gaffar is on screen with us. I said to everybody, you're a writer, you're a comm specialist, but important to also be clear, you served as an editor for something called youthideas.eu, which is a European Parliament youth consultation platform which feeds in to the conference on the future of Europe. So you're going to say a little bit about what's what's been happening with the EIE, just very briefly what it is and how it links to the conference on the future of Europe and those bubbling up ideas, practical ideas that you actually presented, I think, very, very recently, if, if I'm not mistaken, to the Parliament. But also, as I said, some thoughts on how the EU communicates with young people and maybe how you'd see some improvements. So, uh, Gaffer, as we always say, the floor is yours. Thank you. I think you're just, I'm going to give you a moment to adjust your camera. Yeah. You're doing a bit exactly. of fiddling. I can hear it in my earpiece. I no am, problem. I, I personally yeah. love all this live kind of behind the scenes stuff that you get at virtual events. For me, a digital event mm -hmm. is not truly digital if we don't have a bit of this. I think we're good. Are you I showing think? your best side now? You're showing no, the no, yeah. no, You're good, yeah, you're well lit. Okay, fantastic. Everything's fine. Perfect. <laughs> the floor really no, is indeed. yours. Go go for thank it. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for also making everything feel so warm and, and comfortable. I also want to thank um, my previous two speakers for setting the context a little bit because I think a lot of what I'm, a lot of what I'm going to be saying um, this morning uh, is in line with what has already been said. Um, yes, so my name is Gafar. Um, I was an editor, or I was a member of the editorial team that produced the Youth Ideas Report. Let me maybe give a little bit of context about the Youth Ideas Report first, because what the Youth Ideas Report really is, it's the, it's, it's the contribution of young people in Europe towards a much wider consultation process called the Conference on the Future of uh, Europe or on the future of the EU. And this, I think, is worth noting because it's it's a massive consultation process um, that attempts to sketch out the medium to long-term future of uh, Europe, involving citizens and also with a special focus on young people, uh, but also involving civil society, EU institutions, and everyone as equal partners. Right. I think um, a lot of effort has been put into trying to make this as democratic as possible, as uh, engaging as possible. Um, and I will now this morning tell you about one of the ways that this has happened. So as part of the contribution um, to the uh, Conference on the Future of, um, 
of the EU. We had a website. This website was called youthideas.eu. And on youthideas.eu, I believe for a period of about six months, so somewhere um, between April and October, anyone um, across Europe or young people across Europe could submit their ideas for the European Union. And this could be anything, right? This could be whatever they would like to see in uh, the future of Europe. For example, just one random suggestion that came in on the website was uh, to mandate that companies that are bigger than a certain size have to reserve a portion of their employment to new graduates in order to solve the issue of skills mismatch. Uh, graduates around Europe, they graduate from the university, they cannot find a job in the field that they have been educated in, and therefore they find another job in another field, and that creates, um, well, problems in, in the economy and in, in the market. So that's just one, one random idea. I'll come back to a couple of other ideas to make it a little bit more concrete for you later on. Over the period of six months then, we've had 2,000 ideas submitted, 2,000 suggestions submitted. We then had um, a team, an editorial team of 10 people. So I was a member of that, I am still a member of that editorial team. And this editorial team of 10 people, what we did was we analyzed those suggestions. We merged some of them that are a little bit similar. We split the complex ones into smaller pieces to make it more digestible. We edited those ideas to make it more readable. We categorized them into 10 different themes. Climate, education, culture, youth, and sport, health, economy, rule of law, migration, you name it, right? So, so 10 different um, themes. What we were trying to do is um, also provide a little bit of uh, the, the social political context or the, the um, policy mechanisms that, that, that take policy mechanisms in the European institutions. So we were trying to contextualize that to see how can these suggestions, ideas actually apply to, uh, to Europe? Because at the end of the day, all of these uh, were sent, they have been sent already to the European Parliament. They have been sent to the Conference on the Future of Europe. So out of those um, 2,000 suggestions, we created 452 ideas. They were distilled down from 2,000 to 452 ideas. Out of the 452 ideas, we took 10 ideas from each of the 10 themes. No, sorry, five ideas from each of the 10 themes, meaning we had now 50 ideas. So this has already been a six-month process of thousands of ideas down to 50. When we had the 50 ideas, we then um, brought those 50 ideas to the European Youth Event, which is an event that takes place every two years. It gathers 5,000 representatives. Well, this edition was a little bit smaller because of COVID, but still we gathered, um, say, 4,000 representatives of youth and student organizations from all across Europe. So let me just give you some examples. The... Um, Mladinsky Svet Slovenia, which is the National Youth Council of Slovenia, um, the Erasmus Student Network, the uh, Federation of Muslim Youth and Student Organizations, and on and on and on. The youth wings of uh, European political parties, you know, and you go on. So we have 4,000 of these people, and we had um, an on-site workshop. We had an ideation workshop. Out of those 50 ideas, those workshop participants picked 20 ideas. They picked the 20 that they wanted to work on. And uh, over a period of three hours or so, we had 50 participants, 10 editors, three workshop facilitators, and three experts from the European Commission's Joint Research Center who would give input on the feasib feasibility of um, these ideas within a European um, context. In the ideation workshops, we then discussed, is this actually really a good idea? Can we combine it with another idea? How feasible it is? And what are the problems? What are the challenges? If we put forward these ideas, what are the potential criticisms that we, that we might face? How can we make those ideas better, right? Um, yeah, so, so we went, through, uh, went to, through this entire process. I believe it was four hours on a Friday morning. And then in the afternoon, we repeated this. We repeated this, but then online instead. So the people who were not able to attend the European Youth events in person, they participated through um, online workshops. 
And through this entire process, I believe on a Saturday evening, we were scrambling, writing ideas, um, finalizing those ideas down. We had then uh, those 20 ideas that were refined and the 20 ideas were put up for a vote, right? So um, I believe over a period of, period of um, let's see, less than 24 hours, 18 hours maybe? Over a period of 18 hours, voting was open. Um, I may be wrong, don't quote me the number of hours, but uh, people were voting. Um, but most of the people that were at the European event, a youth event were voting, but also our online participants were voting. 2,000 votes came in at the end of the day, and uh, five ideas were voted as the top ones, meaning um, 10, 10 ideas in total were then published in the report, so the youth ideas report for the conference on the future of Europe, but then the five ideas were picked just to uh, give a good impression of what European youth or the young people in Europe find important. This, I, I, I hope you're following me there. The process is a little bit uh, complicated. I hope I was able to explain it clearly for you, but I found it very important to go into a little bit of uh, granular detail because I'm I'm very happy to be part of the process. Honestly, from a, from a personal point of view, I think this is one of the most exciting, one of the most elaborate, and, and one of the most democratic processes says that that I've been uh, I've had a pleasure of um, taking on? part of now okay I'm just I'm yes. just keeping track because I want to get very much because it's absolutely fascinating and I'm glad you unpicked it because there are lots of people who don't know it and also the rigor of the process and the amount of topics and and very clearly you said how on earth can the suggestions apply to eu policy making but i want to make sure i've got time to hear your thoughts too on how the eu communicates with young people so i might ask you to just round off on where we're at with that i think you said you'd presented to the parliament and there was one star suggestion is that right correct yes and, and that is the all right, so the, the suggestion that got voted on most, in fact, two of the suggestions in the top five have to do with climate. And the suggestion that, um, that won was one for a standardized recycling system in the EU. Mm -hmm. So you would have standardized reverse vending machines in the European Union. So instead of buying, uh, let's say, bottled or canned drinks, you would deposit your empty bottles in your empty cans. Okay. In order to make this happen, though, you need to standardize materials, yep. uh, production, you need to standardize processes. This was the winning idea. Okay. And let me just come back to you, because when I talked to you when we were having a chat before this event, I said to you, what fascinates me and um, is not just the whole process of being consulted, being a part of a process that hopefully in practice does help shape policy. And you came up with some very concrete ideas and it was a very rigorous path. But what are your expectations, just as I'm not even saying young people in this case, but what are your expectations in general when you're part of a process what do you expect to get back when you've taken such time to put your energies and ideas? What do you hope to get back? Yes, um, you know, there are so many directions I can take uh, with this question, but I think the most relevant one I, I, I can use right now is I'm, I am speaking to communication professionals, and I, I think a lot of us can agree that communication is not one directional, right? Communication is a loop, communication is constant, feedback is involved. You have to do it constantly. Um, so I think at some point, we, uh, we, the young people in Europe will have said, we have invested our efforts. Um, okay. I, I see the energy, the passion of people who came and submitted their ideas, took the time to do that yeah. uh, during a pandemic, right, came to the event, and sure. they were very excited, very uh, thorough with their, with their ideas, very informed as well. We submit the report, and uh, now, at this point, I have to detach myself a little bit from the from the European Youth Event because, you know, I, I have to speak a little bit more personally. Um, I believe there are not enough feedback mechanisms. Um, I believe that we, we're not hearing enough about how those ideas are going to be used or are they mm -hmm. feasible mm -hmm. or not? And what do the policymakers think about them, um, actually? What I would really like to say from a personal point of view is I would love to be able to engage further, continue this process um, and make it a dialogue, right? 
Make yeah. it continuous. It's not going to finish. You can't just do a consultation, finish, report, deliver, and that's done. Absolutely. Well, in the light of that, you have beautifully segued yourself, which I'm just going to ask you. And the only reason, uh, Gafar, I'm speeding up is because we do have Anuna, and I so want to hear from her, and we've got lots of audience questions, so I want to give you all scope to honour those. But just if you had to say these are the three things that I notice about how the EU communicates... Um, good ones, not so good ones. And this is my one tip of what I would like to see. Now, you've already talked about perhaps better feedback loops, but would there be anything else? So just very briefly, three, that's what I notice. And that's what, if I could wave a magic wand, that's what I'd be asking for. I'll do my best. What I think is uh, very important is that the EU has acknowledged the role of young people in, in the process, because, uh, you know, some of the biggest challenges of our time have to do with young people. Uh, climate change, for example, being you know, a, a, a very clear one. Next year is a European year of, year of youth. I hope that the EU and all of the relevant stakeholders make use of this opportunity to make sure that the EU year of youth or European year of youth is... Um, yeah exploited as, as well as possible in a good way. Um, but also I think one concern I have is uh, it is very difficult to to communicate to um, to all people, right? To all young people across Europe. Mm -hmm. And what I believe or the impression that I get is that European institutions often communicate to young people in Europe through uh, representatives, so through organized mm -hmm. youth. So mm -hmm. whenever there is a consultation, they invite the leaders of youth yeah. organizations, student organizations and these kinds of things which is a little bit of an issue because there are so many people who are not part of organizations, who are not part of clubs, who uh, may not even be reached through uh, online consultation methods, mm -hmm. rural youth, for example, or people who just, they, they have the internet, they're on social media, but they're just not really you know, easily engaged by uh, digital methods of mm -hmm. consultation. So I think that, okay. that is a place where we really need to put in a lot more effort in order to be more inclusive. OK, thank you. What I'm going to do, slightly different with you, Gafar, because we've got lots coming in, I'm going to leave you to cogitate on two questions that have come in and then I'm going to invite you back because I'm going to hear, you know, particularly in this whole theme of youth and we talk climate, a couple of questions and a good one. Um, until what age, says Aida Jimenez Solar, she is a junior communication officer at TESIM, until what age are people considered young and hence can contribute? Now, this is a good one because I remember when I used to be working on EU campaigns in externally in external agencies for the Commission, it did vary and young is, well, up to 35, 40, which makes me happy because then that kind of somehow makes me a teenager being over 50, but I'll let everybody else do the math. So, until what age are people considered young? That's one. And you mentioned in there, I think you said with these 10 themes, one was rule of law. And we've got a question from a Miguel Atane. Forgive me, Miguel, if I have not correctly pronounced your name. What's the best way to approach the situation of rule of law in Poland from a communication point of view? Um, I've seen little sensitivity in national media on this issue. So that's just a couple of questions for you. Have a think. And I'll invite everybody back, all four of you, and we're going to do a kind of a quick fire, what I call brain box bingo round for short, short answers. But first, you can take a breather and I'm going to let our lovely technical team launch the bumper for this last theme, uh, after which I'm going to invite our lovely speaker. Let's see what we're going to talk about. And so let me please invite to join me our Belgian Human Rights Act and climate activists. It's important to put the two together. Sometimes I find it's the human rights for me goes with being a climate activist, but that's my humble opinion. You might say something else, Anuna. You're a Belgian human rights and climate activist. You work with Fridays for Future International, Youth for Climate Belgium. You have a plethora of experience in international campaigns related to both human rights and climate change published author, been in documentaries, but also just a nod to say you've worked uh, on climate campaigns with the Greens in the European Parliament for more than a year. Now, I can see you're at COP. I can see that there's quite a lot going on. People might be a bit more positively surprised. They were a little bit reticent. Literally three or four sentences before I let you present. How are you feeling things there? Give us some news direct, please. I think we might have lost her momentarily again, just 
there she's back. I can see you out the corner of my eye. Just take uh, just literally three or four sentences. How are you? Have any any expectations been met? Are you feeling quite buoyant, more than you thought? Super frustrated, a bit of a mix? Tell us. Hi. Yes, hi. I'm so sorry that I dropped out. I don't know why that happened. But thank you for having me. Um, I want to just quickly start with a, with, a, with a small introduction of who I am. So indeed, I'm Anuna Dweven. I'm a Belgian climate and human rights activist. And it is extremely important to put the two together because for me, they are one and the same thing indeed. Uh, I am currently at COP, so I've been extremely busy. This is the delay. I'm very sorry for that. Uh, but COP is extremely disappointing. If you're asking me uh, about my opinion on what is happening, the negotiations are extremely disappointing. The speeches of our leaders are extremely disappointing, but also the exclusivity of COP and the lack of representation of global South activists, the most affected people and area individuals. So we are really pushing really hard, but it's not been it's not been hopeful and it's not given me um, a lot of hope to be here, honestly, and uh, and the biggest thing for me has been working together with civil society and other international climate movements because this is for me where change happens. Okay. Um, okay. Just to say, can I do, just to frame so that I, I, we're back and I know you know because we we also had an exchange before. But some of the things that are coming out in terms of okay, reversing deforestation, creating markets for new tech. We've got this methane pact. We've heard from India all sorts. Some of those things. If we're looking at deforestation, new technologies are, of course, reflected in the Green Deal. So I'm coming back to this. And I'm also linking to what we just heard from Nando, because when he was part of the flash Eurobarometer talking about how people think, you know, the Green Deal is going, it was a bit, it, it was, ooh, not sure, high expectations. And it wasn't sort of a resounding yes. It was like... Let's sort of see. Not sure yet. So that's the framework. And as a reminder, we're talking about communicating the Green Deal in a time of change. How are we doing it? What should we be doing? And climate change in general. If I can give you about five or six minutes, it leaves more time for questions, if that can work for you. There you go. The floor is yours. Perfect. Perfect. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, well, basically, I think the biggest problem with communication around the Green Deal is that we keep comparing where we are today with what we have been doing instead of where we are today and where we need to get. There is a huge gap of emissions and there's a lot of responsibility that we are not taking, not only in Europe, but with many, many countries. So when we are talking about democracy, which is what we've been doing in this session, I think about honesty. And I think about honesty from our leaders to uh, civilization. And I think about the social contract between people and politicians and the trust that is needed to have that social contract. Currently, we have politicians defending a Green Deal that sets targets by 2030 and 2050, which we know are not consistent with science, which we know will lead us to a world of 2.7 to 3 degrees Celsius. And this is whether we, if we would actually reach those targets, which we won't because our policies are not consistent. But so these targets that we are setting are definitely not enough. And we have leaders preaching about this, saying that they're very ambitious, saying that they're doing the system change that we are demanding them to. But this is not true. If we look at what a three degrees world looks like, it literally leaves millions of people behind and millions of people will end up in a world that is uninhabitable. In, in five years from now, half of the world's population will have experienced water scarcity. By 2050, we'll have over an extra half a billion refugees purely because of the climate crisis. And this is only if we actually reach the targets that we are aiming for. So the world that we are dreaming of altogether is just a world uninhabitable for millions of people. Now, in a communication perspective, this is very interesting to unravel because when I started doing the, the climate strikes in Belgium and it grew into a big international climate movement, we noticed that the only thing we constantly heard from media and from politicians was not any more denial of climate change, but it was the minimization of the climate crisis. And the fact that our politicians and the media kept acting as if it was either too hard, either too difficult, either we were too hysterical, too radical, of course, we are not going to create a platform with people supporting the measures needed if media and politicians keep minimizing what is actually happening. Yeah. So this was extremely disappointing for us to see. And then when the COVID crisis hit, this became a very big metaphor of 
what it should have actually been like. We saw leaders all of a sudden being able to release huge amounts of money to resolve the climate crisis, uh, the COVID pandemic. We saw that there was experts in debates and experts in policymaking. We saw that there were very radical measures for people being uh, taken, not because we had voted on it, but just because it was necessary, because we were in a crisis and it was a matter of life and death. And therefore, our politicians were able to do this. And so if I look at the COVID crisis and how we politically did this, and if I look at the climate crisis and how we politically did this, we should have done it the same way. We need experts. We need huge investments. We need people to know what is going on. We need politicians to be honest because right now we are dealing with politicians that are not only lying about the consequences of the climate crisis, but that are only lying, also lying about the consequences of their policies. And so if we look at the climate crisis, we know that it will be much worse than the COVID pandemic, not only short term, but mostly long term. We know that we are going towards a world that is uninhabitable for millions of people. If I am at COP and I'm working together with civil society organizations or Fridays for Future International members, I'm dealing with people that are directly being affected by the consequence of climate crisis. My friend Hilda from Uganda, she hasn't been able to go to school for two years because the farm that she lives from is literally, because of climate crisis, experiencing such severe droughts that her family doesn't have the income anymore. My friend Mitzi in the Philippines sometimes has to wake up in the middle of the night because the water is at her bed and she literally has to wake up in the middle of the night to scoop the water out and my friend Anita has been a climate activist for her entire life she's my age she lives in the Amazon forest and she's fighting against the Belemonte Dam which will make sure that a huge part of her community will just end up not having uh, any access to water resources anymore and these are the people that I'm working with these are the people that are being directly affected by the climate crisis these are the people that embody the notion that climate change is about human rights and then we look at our leaders and we see them communicate in a way of prosperity in a way of ambition in acting as if we are on track but we are not we are not on track and so this honesty is what we need to to convey again in the way we communicate about the climate crisis. No, we are not on track, but yes, there is a window of opportunity only if we take these radical measures and we need people on board to do that, not to become, uh, not to, to, to feel as if we cannot do anything anymore because there is so much disparity about the climate crisis, but just because we are honest about what is happening today. And this is for us as climate movement, one of our biggest uh, objectives is that we communicate Honestly, we are not radical. We are not hysterical. We communicate honestly about the policies that are happening and the climate crisis that is happening and what it takes for us to do. And what we base that on is science. And this is what our politicians should be doing as well. Thank you. Thank you. I think they're trying. Thank you. So and it always feels a bit crumbs when I hear and, and I, I did a, an event for the UNDP not so long ago with a colleague of yours, I think, uh, also from this sort of Belgian chapter of the movement and spoke also equally with passion. And so when I say thank you at the end, it all feels a bit like a facile sort of response. But let me just hone in and be specific in the time we have available on, on just an issue. You said, listen, the crisis is being minimised. There isn't enough honesty. That's how I think communication should change. You then cited some very real stories. They're your friends. They're people you communicate with. How do you think that that communication can be improved? Um, should there be more stories? Or are stories like that too far away from the likes of me and Joe Bloggs in Slovenia? And, OK, he won't be called Joe Bloggs. Are they... How do you feel that that communication should be, bearing in mind that you're right in it, I'm engaged in it, but not the same way, but I want to do something, bearing in mind that relationship between the politicians that you are not rating and things that we can do. How, how do you want to see communication change for the various stakeholders to be properly engaged going forwards towards something that you say, Kat, we, we, yeah, it's going to be a disaster. Well, for me, it's about responsibility. So when I realized that I'm an extremely privileged woman living in Europe, uh, being middle class, I realized that I have a huge responsibility to be an activist. And I started learning about the fact that the policies we have in the Western world are often based on colonization. 
and racism and exploitation. And so we have a much bigger responsibility to act much more. And I understand that you are posing the right question. These stories that you are talking about of, of people in the global south, aren't they, aren't they too far away? Well, there's two things. First of all, there's a lot of those stories as well in Europe. There is so many things happening. We see, we saw it this summer with the with the huge floods, but also the heat waves and the droughts. And we we know that this is only the beginning. Stories in Europe that are happening, people being directed by directly affected by the consequences. But also, I think what is really important in our communication is that we start talking about the fact that it is our policies causing those damages in the global mm -hmm. south that it is the global north with the illusion of luxury that we live in and the privilege that we have that we do not want to acknowledge that we push through these policies that are causing these things. Uh -huh. And so what we do is we build walls to keep refugees out, but we also are literally the cause of them having to feed their homes because of the climate crisis. We are the most responsible ones. And I don't disagree, and neither did I want to. You are absolutely right. And if I witness what happened in Germany, if I witness what happened in Belgium, where I am based, you're, and, and there are those stories, and I do think that there is that engagement. Sometimes, well, it's a whole... Let me park it for the minute, absolutely, and... The message is clear. I just want one more thing before and then everyone's going to come back for brain box bingo. There was a gentleman, I didn't catch his name, right in the opening when uh, we heard Ella and Alejandro introducing uh, this from the lobby, who said politicians can't know everything. They need not just comms people around them, but advisors around them. They can't know everything. If you had to say one positive thing, and I absolutely unequivocally hear what you say and don't disagree but if you had to say something right because I worry of a polarization between young people and the rest and we don't know quite what young is is it 35 is it 21 is it 27 we've just asked that question very quickly um, what would you say Kat this is what I do see this is what I want to build on so you've said we need to be more truthful you said we need to get off our ass we need to share that responsibility we need to be credible don't minimize what do you see that is happening that you think that's what we need to build on in terms of comms Yes, I think projects like Gavar's project are extremely valuable. These are projects that bring youth voices closer to where the, the action and the negotiations actually happen. And, and this is why, especially at, on places like COP, it is extremely important that youth voices are being platformed and we get a chance to, to share our opinions and, and our analysis about what is happening in the world. So what I see that is really good is because of the a huge amount of pressure we have put with our international climate movement. We also get into these spaces. We get into one-on-one -on -one conversations with politicians. We get into the plenaries. We get into the negotiations. And this needs to happen much more because if the decisions being made today are going to define what the rest of humanity and the rest of this world looks like, literally my entire life, then we should also have that seat at the table. And we see that happen more and more. And in regards to communication, this is absolutely crucial if these policies want any credibility. Thank you for that. And you've beautifully led me into a first question that I've got for Dominique. Thank you. Hold that thought for a moment. If I can invite all four back, because I think this critical issue, you're saying get in the same room. Now, sometimes get in the same room at the moment is digital. But there are about three questions, Dominique, for you. And I'm going to reiterate to everybody, beautiful. We are in a game show sharing part of the contents of our fabulous brain so that I can try and hit all of these questions that come in. Dominique, how can we keep the human connection when digitalization is evolving very rapidly? Let me just ask our technical team to leave us all together on screen now, all of us, that would be brilliant. Somebody else, Litsa, Kunto, uh, sorry, Kunto Ridu, who is a scientific officer at the Research and Innovation Foundation, says, yeah, how do we really go about forming a human connection? And then uh, Mila uh, Kakoarelli says, how can we make sure to have human contact if meetings are going on digital? And how on earth can you read a room if we're not physically together? A beautifully beef response to that. How can we reinforce that human connection in this digital age? Well... I want to sort of go back to what Angela Merkel said when we all had to wear a mask. She says, like, maybe you can do a bit more of that. So, of course, this is just a, a symbolic for you got to be changing your language. So you have to make people be able to relate to who you are and what you do and what you want a little bit more. So maybe you have to use more emotional language 
You also see it with the speeches, how people sort of try to find bits and bobs that make it easy for the audience to connect to the speaker. And I think you need to do something very similar. So that also goes back to being authentic. So if you, if how can you make a human connection? First of all, by being human, even if you're talking through an institutional account, there's still a human or a group of people sitting behind it. And it's okay if that shows that there are people and not robots actually creating the content. Mm -hmm. I think this is the secret to it. Yeah. And um, when it comes to the third question about actually making human connections, I think, you know, life is a bit easing up. So don't go to the office to work. Just go to the office to specifically meet with people, to connect with them. Don't talk about your project. Just really talk to them about being human and what you did as a human in this professional position you are in. So use the real meetings, the in-person meetings to connect and use emails and digital to exchange yeah. information. Mm -hmm. Use the tools in the right way, in a much more customised way. I would also add that, I mean, I personally find that uh, I'm going to misquote Shakespeare, which is dreadful because he is one of my favourite authors, but either the mirror or the windows of the soul. I mean, I do find that that is the case, personally in digital, but I also find sometimes, do you know, a phone call. I mean, for me, a human connection, sometimes you focus all your attention when you are listening to it. Sounds funny. I don't want to be an old fart. In fact, Gaffer is nodding, so I'm not being an old fart. But a phone call can sometimes absolutely take you into that space. Before, um, before I move to Nando, one other question, please. And that's, could you just give, could you share um, a couple of good sources for evidence of the changes you mentioned? That's an interesting one, and it doesn't say who it's from. Material that can convince management and stakeholders of this new digital world. So that's somebody who's struggling still to convince. Maybe those people they're trying to convince are skeptics. Maybe they're afraid. Maybe they're dinosaurs. Maybe they're who knows. But if you had to just give one uh, piece of advice to do some convincing, what would it be? It's really hard to convince people of the reality they are surrounded by, right? Reality is digital, it's here and it works. So people who still deny that it is there and it works, um, I'm not sure if you can help them. So maybe you need to ease them in and have them again, dip in the toe, dip in the foot, and then go all the way with your leg and to your hip. But um, I see, ex I know exactly where you come from because I know exactly what it is when you feel like, oh, I'm explaining the internet again. So I thought we already accepted this, but you have to do it. Like a preacher, you have to explain it over and over again and find little examples. That I was just going to pick, yeah. Relate to. I was going to just pick up on that. People always want to know how it benefits them, don't they? Whether it's benefiting your bottom line, whether it's a return on investment, whether it's getting you more customers, whether it's getting you a more diverse workforce, whether it's making you more agile, whether it's making you more sustainable as your company. I think your apps are examples of how it actually can benefit them. And I think personally that work needs to be done. Can I just turn now to Nando? Um, again, we're coming back to this issue of elected leaders, politicians. We heard very, you know, passionately there from Anuna, come on, they're just not actually being honest. Uh, we heard then at the beginning, but politicians need some help. They actually sometimes need more help than you would think. They're grappling with a lot of different issues, navigating their way through this changing age and changing the communication. We've got Christina Papadopoulou from the Ministry of Development saying people are the leaders. And so elected members should act as they are told. But unfortunately, this isn't happening. What's your opinion as that relates to democracy, Nando? We elect them. Hey, they should do what we ask, but they're not. What are your thoughts on that? True, this is a risk, of course. But I honestly, I, I think that COVID could be really a great opportunity to reinforce democracy. Because uh, we see institutions are closer to citizens in this moment, and politicians also. And the public communication, the institutional communication, is uh, more focused on uh, the public interest, mm -hmm. uh, the sense of cohesion, uh, the sense of responsibility, the confidence. So in this moment, we need 
to be more uh, conscious of the importance of cohesion. Mm -hmm. And politicians and institutions uh, have to be uh, more focused on the interest of citizens. I this is a problem. Yeah, and I, I think you're right in saying, and you've heard, one has heard this time and time again, never waste a good crisis in so many ways, whether it's don't waste COVID in terms of environmental gains, but don't waste it in terms of perhaps a new, a refreshed dynamic between policymakers and citizens. And I think you're right, because they are being more scrutinised at the moment, far more than before. But let me just, again, I am scratching the surface. We've We've got only five minutes. I've got a question for Gaffa and a close for everybody. Uh, Nando, briefly, is there any statistics that give insights where in EU national governments, do they communicate in a way that either supports, is neutral or undermines or counters EU communication mm -hmm. efforts? Is there any statistics that you have to see how that works mm -hmm. nationally? <laughs> statistics uh, you don't have to provide them I don't I want to know is just does any of your research encompass seeing how uh, national governments are communicating on the EU to their citizens okay. I love it he's got a whole team with him <laughs> I love it uh, there is data on uh, effectiveness of communication of course but uh, it's not only communication, I think, are the facts, are the decision taken mm -hmm. from you. For instance, during the Greek crisis, uh, uh, we, we had a lack of confidence on uh, right. European Union. Uh, it, it was independent of the communication. Mm -hmm. So we have to manage uh, carefully uh, facts and communications. Okay. Uh, because uh, it's not uh, automatic uh, <laughs> to have no. a change of opinion. Absolutely. But uh, maybe what I, what I will say, because we've only got three minutes left, whoever did pose that question, it's Ipsos. I would say please do get in touch with Nando or your colleagues, Nando, if that's OK. We've got the contacts on the platform and I think then you will have more detail. A couple of moments, Gaffar, you've got to do a 30 seconds for each answer. You heard the questions. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Let's bring Gaffar to the screen with me. Thank you. There you Next go. Test. Am I back? I'll do, I'll do my best. I think, you know, in terms of, uh, I'll answer the second con uh, question, how to communicate. People, there is no silver bullet. You have to put in the effort. You have to, in you have to want it. You have to invest the effort. You have to exercise empathy. You have to be humble. You have to learn the lessons. You have to make some mistakes and you have to relearn again. You have to try it out. You have to talk to people. You know, it's, Every situation is going to be different. And I think when we communicate about the rule of law in uh, a country like Greece or in a country like Poland or in a country like the Netherlands, every situation is going to be a little bit different. That's uh, I wish I could say more, but uh, we're a little bit pressed for time. So put in the effort, relearn, try, try again. Thank you. And what I will say to those of you, would that be fair to say, if we can see all of our speakers again, I've got one more question for Anuna and I'm going to close. People, they can, they can see your details on the platform. If anybody wants to engage with you, um, you won't get a whole, you know, thunderstorms worth. But would can can I have your permission to say you're happy to engage with those who want to engage with you? Would that be fair? Yeah, thumbs up. Let, let Anuna get through COP26 first, though. Anuna, there seems to be... I'm going to group together a question. Please keep a short answer. Any interest by Friday for Future Movement to run in elections? Local level, national level, change policies that way. Um, what sort of what sort of things could you challenge leaders with their various privileges? And are you trying? Are you going to politicise this movement? Uh, what's the next steps for you? Yeah, super briefly. I think the power of the movement is the fact that we are not a part of party politics because within party politics, it always seems as if climate change is a left-wing problem and it's most definitely not. So we want to stay as far away from that as possible. We saw how much impact we have had by marching on the streets with thousands of people week after week. And this is civil society putting pressure. We are a bottom-up movement, so we want this. If there's individuals in Fridays for Future 
international that want to run, I would most definitely vote for them, but I have no idea if there is people now wanting to do that. And I think this movement is not in the political field. We put pressure okay. on the political but, field. We and, have bridges with the political field. And you also and, work with the political sphere. We talked about the Greens and the European Free Alliance, did we not? On that note, you've all been fabulous. Let me see all of you. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. You're brilliant. I hope people engage with you further. I've not now got to take everybody back to the lobby. They're going to see Alejandro and Ella. And then I'm going to, in 15 minutes, run the Europe Com talks when we're going to go into all of these scenes in more detail with even more passionate, fabulous, smart, intelligent people. Can I thank all of you? Gaffar, Anuna, um, who else do we have? We have uh, Nando and we also have Dominique. You are all stars. And on that note, over to the lobby. Thank you all.